and welcome to As It Comes, life from a musician's point of view. I'm Davina, I'm a freelance cellist based in London, and I'm wishing you the best for 2021. 2020, am I right? Here in the UK, it feels a bit like 2020 plus, as infection rates are soaring amidst contradicting advice from various authorities. And actually, right now on my iPad, a little notification has just flashed up. Boris Johnson to make TV address to the nation at 8pm. Oh, what a surprise. Why does this always happen as soon as I record a podcast episode? <laughs> anyway, last year, I felt like it was easier to stay positive because we always had the excuse of holding out until the new year. I mean, we always do this. I guess that's why we have things like New Year's resolutions, as we take it as an opportunity to make a new start. But when you're in the middle of a pandemic... And the new year is just a Friday after a Thursday and a series of monotonous weeks indoors. It's hard to feel like you can start afresh. So while I say Happy New Year, I say that with a firm foot in the reality that a lot of things are the same. What can we do to make things better? It's down to our choices. What we choose to do from day to day. Though that being said, I pretty much lost all consciousness of time and space in the final weeks of December as the Davina-shaped indentation in my couch got larger and larger. While some things like that got larger, other things, like my decisions, I'm going to keep small, manageable, and positive as much as possible. Schedule a long overdue chat with a friend. Write to that person I've been meaning to for ages. Cook something nice for dinner that constitutes colours other than yellow. Eat something nice for dinner that only constitutes the colour yellow. Plenty of little choices to make for the better. And with these small, manageable, positive choices that I make each day, I'm just going to keep going until... I've no idea what's going to happen. I will keep going until I need to make more decisions. But at least they're giving me a sense of purpose during this time. And speaking of keeping on, the title of this podcast episode, I just kept going with it, are words taken from my guest, Joe DeFiore. Joe is an American sax and wind player based in LA who also composes and arranges. I feel like his words illustrate the importance of finding what we like and pursuing those interests. You'll hear about some things in the chat where he's chosen not to go all in, and it's just as important to remember the things not worth going after. We had a chat late last year, just after Thanksgiving, about how he's been keeping busy during the pandemic, including lots of recording and arranging. If you're interested in remote recording from home, then listen to Joe's story on how he got started with this line of work, how investing in good gear is like investing in a good instrument. In fact, the whole process is like learning a new instrument and the importance of being patient. And as two Nintendo nerds, we also chat about what video game music means to us. Fancy listening to a fabulous American accent? Have a listen to my chat with Joe. We should be good. I might just kick things off officially, if everything's all good with yeah. you. Great. With me. So... Joe DeFiore, welcome to the podcast. Good morning to you. I believe it's about 10.30 in the morning in LA, and here I am in London speaking to you in my evening. It's a pleasure to have you here on the podcast tonight. And I thought I'd ask you, because it's fairly topical, we're speaking in the week following Thanksgiving in 2020, and in light of this being such a weird year, what's something that you've been thankful for? Yeah, uh, a couple of things come to mind. I think the, certainly the first th thing I'm thankful for is friends and family. I think you kind of see from this pandemic that's been going on too, and you're having to stay home uh, for uh, certainly most of the world is that you you kind of learn to appreciate what kind of gets you through life, if you will, is just your, your strong relationship with your friends and your family. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I think yeah. it's good to have that support you have with people as well that are close to you so i th i would say that's certainly one thing that uh, comes to mind is certainly um yeah friends yeah. and family for sure have you managed to have friends and family close to you during the pandemic and even last week during thanksgiving did you manage to spend time with them yeah it was just uh my it was just myself my brother and my mom so it was just kind of 
keeping that uh i think it's like the three households like recommended here so uh yeah so it's a small group in some ways it could be better because it's it's nice to have that small group so it's more intimate that way so i don't know maybe it's just me making a positive light <laughs> of everything <laughs> but that's a good thing though isn't it i mean i think you're lucky that you get to have three households together but then you know as you say it is nice just to keep things intimate isn't it and you feel like you can speak to everyone around the table rather than missing someone who's way at the end or something yeah definitely you know there i think whenever i go to like thanksgiving in the past i would see just whatever family members and that you know you kind of mostly see on the holidays and you're like uh, you, you, I don't know if I'd say you tolerate them because that sounds really mean, but like <laughs> you, they just make these statements like, okay, and you just kind of let it go. Yeah, yeah for <laughs> sure. Know? Like those family members where you see them maybe once a year and maybe that's quite enough for you. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. And so what sort of state of lockdown or restrictions are you in at the moment in LA? Well, it just got a lot worse because <laughs> of uh, flu season and everything like that. So they have certain color tiers, so we're just put into purple tier right now. Well, the biggest thing is that many things are at certain capacity. I think a lot of places have kind of shut down more, too. I know in L.A. County, they just kind of banned outdoor dining for the time being. So, oh. so that's really sad. But, yeah, it's... It's basically just limiting the capacity of certain places, I've noticed. And basically, it's the same thing. Just stay the typical, I guess, stay home word, if you will. Yeah, stay home, work at home if you can. Yeah. Purple sounds quite dire, though. Is that the worst or is there more? It is the worst, yeah, basically. <laughs> it I think just it was like reminds me of you know, the purple sky before a thunderstorm. It looks quite yeah, pretty, exactly. but actually it's quite ominous, isn't it? Yes, exactly. I'm wishing you all the best for your purple-tiered lockdown. Yeah. So, I mean, speaking of lockdown, you know, you've been keeping yourself really busy during this year. Yes. Um, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about re remote recording, because obviously that's something that so many musicians have had to do this year and something that you've done a lot of yourself. But first of all, so you're a wind player based mm -hmm. in LA, as we've mentioned, and you play and record on various instruments, including saxophone, flute, a whole bunch of others, <laughs> I believe. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your musical journey as someone who performs and records, but you also arrange and compose as well. Sure. Tell me a little bit about what led you to playing lots of different instruments. Yeah. Uh, so, well, I should note that I started on saxophone. I took like piano lessons when I was about eight years old, um, but that didn't last for very long too. But I really started playing like, I guess, regularly when in kind of school band. So when I was about 10, and then I just kind of kept going and went through all through middle school, which this, you know, is like, like, like 11 through 13 ages. Yeah. And, um, and then it kind of came to a point in high school where I started playing in a jazz band too, and concert band and everything. Now, when you live in LA too, you also have like all these incredible musicians that you can study with as well. You know, mm -hmm. so I stay, I started studying with this one saxophone player named uh, Rusty Higgins, who does a lot of the s session studio work, uh, you know, with like Barbara Streisand and Michael Bublé and oh, like wow. all those like records, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I remember just the first few lessons or something like that. I was only like 15. He's like, you know, a lot of these players, a lot of these working players in town who do all the session work and all the high profile jobs, they, they double on flute and clarinet. Mm, He's like, yeah. you could, if you want, but if you, but I'm just saying, if you want to be a working musician here in town, you should learn to play flute and clarinet. Yeah. That's quite a common thing for wind players, especially, isn't it? Because I, I noticed that in, in London, in the West End, you mm -hmm. know, you are the wind player. You play yeah. your saxophone, clarinet, flute, maybe bassoon as well, if you if you can do that. Right. And they don't necessarily have individual players for sure. all the different instruments. Is it particularly easy to switch between the different instruments? <laughs> well, the short answer is no. But <laughs> in some cases, yes, because... Well, if you think of something like flute, the fingerings themselves are fairly similar to saxophone until you get to the really high register where it's nothing like saxophone at all. But it's also, the embouchure is also nothing like saxophone at all. Of course, yeah. But there are also kind of similarities and certainly positives to learning these instruments too. So for example, clarinet. So it's a very common actually story that's that you'd see people who play clarinet and then they learn saxophone later because it's such an easy, easy adjustment. Yeah, um, the reeds. 
Right. Yeah, the reeds, the ombres is a little bit tighter too, I guess for lack of a better way of saying it, on clarinet than on saxophone. So the good news is that you can actually, you could play clarinet, like say if you play both saxophone and clarinet, you could just practice cl straight clarinet if you played like every day for a couple hours for a week and you could pick up saxophone again and feel like you hadn't lose a, lost a day on saxophone. Yeah. Right. So there's certainly similarities and there's certainly something that you can kind of transfer over. Yeah. That must be really useful. So I guess it was quite a turn of fate that you had this teacher that told you at such a formative mm -hmm. age, you need to, if you want to be a working musician, <laughs> you need to learn all of these instruments. So then <laughs> what brought you forward from there? I mean, I've kind of always, I've, I've kind of always known that I'd want to be a musician for a living since I was like 13. So I know that happened, but I think I saw the type of work that I wanted to do at that time too, which was especially like the kind of like session work and especially for musicals. Musicals are, are obvious example too, where certainly doubling is needed as well. Yeah. Um, even stuff back in the 1960s, if you look at like shows like the Flintstones that have like a typical big band and then all the saxophone players also play flute and clarinet as well. Mm. Uh, so I just kind of kept going with it. But part of it, too, is that I also love playing these as well. Um, I start the first instrument I quote unquote doubled on was clarinet because I don't know. I think I think at the time I thought that. Well, A, it's the harder instrument for flute, which is mostly true. And then B, I was like, well, there aren't my clarinet players, so maybe it's not as competitive. Oh. <laughs> so I'll try that. <laughs> Famous last words. <laughs> oh, seriously. And maybe that was true at the time for my high school because they were uh, low on clarinets at that very at that time that it was in there. But I just kind of kept at it, chucking along with clarinet. I eventually started actually taking uh, private lessons with all these specific instruments, too with clarinet and flute, especially when I got to uh, university as well. I started to love all these instruments. and um, That's a good yeah. sign, isn't it? If you love something, then that's a good enough reason just to keep going. Someone asked me recently, why did I choose cello? What sparked it all for me? And basically my answer, I summed it up really, really quickly, was I started when I was eight years old and then I just never stopped. So it's yeah. just one of those things, you know, if you, if you love something, you just keep going and you make it work for yourself sure and it's about finding what you like too, like what you have the drive for specifically you know like i have i do have as you said i do have some friends that play bassoon as well and i've played bassoon but for me it's i don't have the drive to like you have with instruments like that you have to go all in with it yeah you know? yeah <laughs> you don't you don't quite have the drive to carve your own reeds and uh do all your winding and stuff Ugh. Can't even tell you. <laughs> I already spend enough. I always spend enough time playing three instruments and composing and arranging. So to add another instrument, let alone making reeds, is the a whole nother thing. I <laughs> yeah, can't totally. do it all, you know. You have no time to do anything else in your life. <laughs> it's true. But the composing arranging thing actually came in, I think, around high school too. I I grew up listening to uh, Frank Sinatra, thanks to my parents and grandparents too, and I just remember loving that sound of just that big fat big band sound you know of just the the brass and the saxes and everything like that too and i don't know it's just one of the things that kind of crept up on me where i just kind of wanted something more i guess too mm -hmm. so very slowly i started kind of writing stuff too starting in high school and then it really kind of fruitioned in call it in a uh, university which is what i majored in which composition mm -hmm. so same thing just kept going with it and kept doing it <laughs> Just keep going. Just keep swimming like Dory yeah, and exactly. finding Nemo. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it must be useful, I suppose, as a composer as well, having these insights on all the different instruments so that you feel like you can write or you can arrange idiomatically for these instruments. Very much so. I think it's useful for any composer to also play and have experience playing in a band too, and vice versa. Because, so for example, like I've spent many many years like just playing in big bands and so while i don't play trumpet or trombone i know what's idiomatic and i know more or less what works and everything just from hearing it and understanding like oh that's what's in their range for it or you know yeah and even for me playing clarinet and orchestra too i at least have a better idea of how to write for strings as well yeah yeah so, because then you you have 
a perspective as to the different roles in an orchestra as well and orchestration and color and, and things like that that you're used to listening to and hearing all around you I, I would add too to that that you know a lot of my arranging gets comes from just come something I just kind of just imagine in the first place too yeah. so I think just imagining like this would sound cool if it was like cello and alto flute playing here you mm-hmm. know or just as a random example that oh, this can kind of provide this color or this color because I remember hearing this somewhere playing in orchestra or big band or what have you. Yeah, and I think that's why it's, it's so important to play in ensembles. As you mentioned before, anyone who composes or arranges should have this mm-hmm. experience sitting in an ensemble because it just makes you aware of all these different possibilities. Yeah, absolutely. You also do lots of remote recording as well, mm-hmm. putting your skills on various instruments to use in a year such as 2020 with the pandemic and remote recordings being such a necessity for musicians around the world to keep working. So what are some pieces of advice that you could give musicians who are starting out their home studio? I mean, you can look at any thread on social media these days and there is bound to be a musician asking something like, help, I need help with gear, you know. What are some words that you can share to help those people out? Yeah, well, the first one is that to understand that it it is an investment. And in many cases, it's like buying another instrument altogether. You know, I think with my equipment altogether, it's a pretty much adds up to be about as much as you would buy for a new instrument in general. Well, depends on what kind of instrument we're talking about, though. I'm a string player. (laughs) I don't fully know string player, but it's probably the similar to buying like a trumpet or something like that, I would guess. (laughs) I'll put it up, I guess, to put it like that. But I I would say, so it is an investment. I mean, okay, so the good news is that most people have either some sort of garage, like garage band on at least one of their uh, platforms. And as long as you have that, you can get a, a recording interface. Mm-hmm. which can usually connect to your computer. Some people also record on iPad too. That can work as well. And as long as you get a mic too, yeah. it's all, and that's, I mean, that's really, oh, and headphones too. Yeah. But that's pretty much all you need. I, I started doing that uh, when I was in university as well. Cause I took an audio recording class. I was like, this is kind of cool. I want to kind of try this, you know? Yeah. So for a while I had like, just like a hundred dollar interface and a hundred dollar mic for quite a while. And I just mm-hmm. never knew to do about it. And then just kind of all of a sudden I started getting work through an app or these like a recording session, remote recording work too. And which gave me like a ton of experience to try to just start, you yeah. know, take your $100 interface, your $100 mic kind of for a test drive and just get experience that way. And just make sure yeah. that you know how all the gear works first before yes. investing in something absolutely ridiculous yes. and then not having all the gear, no idea kind of thing, which I think a lot of people fall into the trap of. They buy the fancy microphone and then not how to use it properly. <laughs> yeah. I think for me is that you, you kind of know how it works. And then once you know how it works, you're like, you get to a point where like, this could be better. Oh, know, I know. A, yeah. It's so addictive, yeah. isn't it? You probably get this, but I've had another composer friend talk to me about gear acquisition syndrome or <laughs> gas. Where you, yeah. you you buy like one microphone and then you realize, oh, but now I need this. And then I yeah. need this one. And this model's coming out and it's amazing. All of a sudden you've got like 10 microphones. <laughs> yeah. Which is, which as I was saying is exactly like equipment for an instrument, you know? It's the exact same thing as it's like the equivalent of me saying like, oh, I got a new mouthpiece. Oh, I got this new ligature. You know, it's the, it's, it's a very similar type of deal. <laughs> yeah. So gear, mm-hmm. definitely an investment yeah. in terms of actually going about and finding work. So you mentioned you got some experience working through an app. Um, mm-hmm. And how else do you go about finding remote recording work? Oh, this is I used to do a lot actually was was actually Craigslist I did ads for a little bit too and that actually okay. helped too. Is Craigslist like I don't think we have that in the UK but I, oh, really? I think I know what okay. it is. It's like public listings you you put exactly an ad it's like a public listing wanted or for sale kind of thing. Yes, yeah. exactly. So it's just I think posting on public listings help a lot too. There's not just one surefire thing. There's a ton of different things you could do. Um, yeah. Certainly, social media posting about it is one thing, making people aware of that. And then a lot of it too is just kind of the typical like how you get any gig, just yeah. like word of mouth, 
you yeah. know? And fostering relationships with people that you know, isn't it? Like I, I definitely yes. know people who've gone work, and myself included, because I just happen to be friends with certain composers or arrangers and they, if they know that you're around, then you're more likely to be on their radar for when work pops up. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure you've gotten the same thing where – somebody's like oh do you record this or do you do you do this you know and, and you'd be like um yeah I th- yeah i can and then yeah. they hire for it right yeah yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> you just say yes first and then you figure exactly. out the logistics afterwards exactly <laughs> yeah and then but, also in terms of doing the actual work as well what are your suggestions for you know playing in certain rooms do you do much treatment to your rooms to make sure that the room is a certain dryness or boominess or things like that so typically you try to keep it as dry as you can for remote recording work typically what people want is that you don't want much natural reverb in and of itself because they want to add the reverb sure. after. So yeah. they typically want just like dry wave file. You could treat the sound. My my room is typically okay, uh, where it's not a whole lot of reverb at all. You could put up some things. I haven't really had to put too much time into that too because yeah. most rooms, unless you're going to like record in a bathroom or something like that, <laughs> you shouldn't have. <laughs> wow, I sound amazing. Yeah, I know. Really makes me feel good about myself. That's an interesting point, actually. I don't know what residential situations are like in LA, but in London, yeah. you know, quite often you're living underneath someone or you're living on top of someone. And so there's that compromise sometimes. You have to think, oh, are the upstairs neighbors going to put on their washing right when I'm about to record? Or right. is the rubbish truck going to arrive <laughs> at the beginning of the session? Yeah, that's always a, tr- a tricky one, too, that I unfortunately don't have a full answer to. I've, I have a friend's studio, actually, in that every time that we have to stop just because there's a train going by. Oh, man. So yeah. it's, there's, there's no surefire way yeah. uh, of doing that. I'm trying to remember what it was. I'm, I'm, there's something that you could put on like the corner of your walls. And I wish I could remember what it's called exactly. I'm told, I, I remember what it looks like. It's like this piece of... like. I don't know if it's foam necessarily, but it's like kind of a piece of gray that you mm. put on the corners and it kind of basically just uh, limits uh, the type of reverb. Oh, that's pretty cool. I mean, I again, like that's called, but... like further investment, isn't it? Once you've got all the gear, then you can stop thinking about gear and start thinking about how to treat your room. And then it's yeah. like buying another instrument, as you say. But exactly. yeah, I mean, there's there's all sorts of things with recording at home that you just don't think about when you go to a studio perhaps sure. to work and you're already in this perfect environment but then at home there's plenty of other things you've got to think about you know right babies next door animals walking in the room <laughs> turning off things. ac as well that's really interesting to hear about your insights into remote recording and also your yeah. um struggles as well can i also add one more thing too i think the third one that i forgot to mention is to be patient because i can't even tell you how many problems i've came across um when recording and it's in it's always something different too like why isn't it recording or why am i not hearing myself or why is this crashing you know i think we just have to be i think those who start remote recording i think we just have to be patient and understand that in some ways, it is kind of like learning another instrument, and yeah. we have to understand that it's going to take time, and there's no there's no problem in asking for help with people, if need be, or YouTube videos, too. Yeah, oh, for sure. I mean, that's basically how I, I learned how to make a podcast was via YouTube tutorials. But yeah, that's yeah. very true, and in general as well in life, especially in this year where we're all in a very vulnerable state, asking for help yeah. is the best thing that you can do. Absolutely. But yeah, absolutely. There's, it's such a steep learning curve for a lot of people. And I hope your words have been really helpful for mm-hmm. people who are wanting to go down this avenue. But speaking of mm-hmm. recording, I know that you've done a lot of YouTube videos and you've done some recordings of mm-hmm. uh, some video game music. Yeah. <laughs> and we have to talk about this, obviously, because one of my favorite games of all time is Animal Crossing, which is on mm-hmm. Nintendo Switch. And I was very, very pleased also to see that you'd recorded music, not only to that, but also for Super Mario Odyssey, which, in my opinion, one of the best games in the world. Well, agreed. <laughs> I saw that and I thought, we can definitely be friends. Yes. But um, in terms of video game music, tell me about your experiences with video game music and what are your favorite pieces from the genre? 
I think it's similar to any kind of other music that we kind of grew up with. Like in a similar way, I kind of grew up, I remember Nintendo 64 was the first console I ever owned, you know, when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. So of course the music to like Mario and, and Zelda are like stuck in my head forever. And they just kind of hold a certain place to me. I just wanted to start the channel too, because I love that, that music so much too. And it would just be stuck in my head all the time. I was like, I kind of want to make something of this, you know? Okay. And it, so it kind of gave me an avenue to kind of keep on a theme too, because it happens so many times where it's just like, oh, I love that theme. Even then there's still so many, there's like a number of songs and pieces that are from whatever video games that I, st- that I still want to do that I haven't gone quite around to doing just yet. I certainly any kind of Zelda, anything of Ocarina of Time is certainly one that is just beautiful and beautiful melodies. I see. I think certainly at that time, and I think a lot of the Mario games have, and Animal Crossing do really uh, such a excellent job of just writing really memorable melodies. Yeah, you know. Yeah, absolutely. That totally gets stuck in your head. I mean, I don't know if you played Animal Crossing last week when it was Turkey Day. And that was that was a good almost a week ago, and yeah. it's one song basically that goes for the entire day on loop. Yeah. It's still in my head, still <laughs> in my head, and it's not right. going anywhere. I mean, I don't really mind because it's such a an endearing tune, and it's very very heartwarming. Mm-hmm. But that's yeah. the sort of power of these games, games is music, isn't it? Is yes, it's so memorable and just great melodies, and they just keep churning them out. Yeah, I think when you, especially when with games that have like Animal Crossing, that music is such a big part of it too. You know, whether it's going to KK Slider for the uh, <laughs> concerts on Saturday. Although I have to say, KK's voice, KK is like the superstar musical dog that appears on your island on Animal Crossing for the right. uninitiated. His voice is next level annoying. <laughs> right, <laughs> but to be fair, he. There, there are some because there's so many songs that he that he has in his catalog that it's like some of them are like, oh, this is pretty, this is pretty cool. Yeah, you know? yeah. What one are you gonna yeah. do next? <laughs> oh, so the next one I'm I'm doing I'm actually probably gonna finish editing this today is a it's gonna be a rock one of F Zero actually. Right. Yeah. Oh, Mute City and Big Blue is the time. So. Yeah, from um, Mario Kart as well. Yes, that's actually the version I'm doing of that too. Oh, man. So I'm doing a few friends. Oh, that's so awesome! Those are great tracks. Ooh, yeah, it's a really yeah, it's good. So it's like a whole thing where I have just a few friends I recorded with. So it's like, the, it's like basically ri- like typical rock rhythm section of like drums, bass, two guitars, keyboard, and I'm playing saxophone on it. So yeah, yeah, man, yeah, there's great. some like mean saxophone looks um, throughout right. the Mario Kart um, yes. tracks. Exactly. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. I don't know if you know, but in like the in the jazz community online, there's a whole like people made a meme out of the Mario Kart lick. If you oh, know yeah. that. Oh, I think so, I have seen that video. And yeah, it's that yeah. guy playing Mario Kart, and then he hears that lick, and he's like, oh. yeah. <laughs> and then he yes. like he slips it into one of his solos in, in his band, and all his yes. bandmates are like, yeah, man. <laughs> exactly. So it's funny how it just translates to uh, the musical community in general, you know. And I think in the same, in a similar way that perhaps film music has impacted it too. Yeah, you know. Yeah, but it's it's a nice feeling, isn't it? You know, it's one of those things where if you get it, if you know, you know, and it just yeah. feels like really, really special when you hear yes. it. Yes, oh, absolutely. Man. Have you done Gusty Gardens from Mario Galaxy? Yes, I have. And that is have. that is such a beautiful one. That is like. Every time I think, I'm like, man, this is like something that like Tchaikovsky would write back in the day, yeah. for sure. Beautiful sweeping you know? melodies as you yes, hold on to a exactly. dandelion leaf and try not to fall off the edge of the world. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Did you do that on oboe? Can you play the oboe? I have an oboe, but it's one of those things where I kind of I haven't felt the need to kind of go like all in with it. You okay, know like I mean? like the bassoon so again. Maybe it's yeah. a double raid thing for you. <laughs> it is it, partially, yeah. <laughs> but again, it's just like another investment too. You know, it's and uh, having a really solid ovo is, I guess, similar to uh, the other instance is a lot of investing. You know, a lot of money to invest in. Yeah, you know? for sure. And there are other things you'd probably maybe want to do with your life, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I so. look forward to more video game recordings on your YouTube channel. Um, it's always such a mm-hmm. delight to see things like that, especially because I feel quite well ensconced in the Nintendo Switch community these days, as do a lot of my peers now in lockdown. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
So moving on, you may or may not be aware that in my podcast, I have a segment called the wildcard question round. Mm -hmm. And this is where you have the chance to choose what I ask you next based on three choices that I present Mm. you. All right. Go for it. Cool. Okay. So your topics are, and you can choose one of them, precious musical gear, New Year's resolutions, and breakfast habits. I'll do the, I'll do the gear. <laughs> Precious musical <laughs> car. What was it? <laughs> Precious musical gear. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. 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 Brilliant. So, tell me, what is your most treasured musical possession? So it is my alto saxophone. For those who are also saxophone players, my my saxophone is the Selmer Mark Seven which is essentially kind of like the second best instrument you could get anywhere, the first being Mark VI. The reason why that specifically is is not just because of how uh, valuable it is, but also because it was my dad's instrument too. Oh, amazing. He, he doesn't really play. He didn't really... So he played in high school and middle school and, and part of college, but for some reason he just kind of like kept the saxophone like throughout the whole time. So like throughout like his whole life. So I, when I was a kid, I would always see it, you know. And so by the time school band rolled around, I'm like, oh, I want to play saxophone. My dad has one, <laughs> you know. So, Sweet. That's an easy decision. Great. <laughs> exactly. So and, and, what's, and it's really funny, too, because I'm playing I'm playing this, like, Selmer Mark Seven, which is, like, you know, and those horns go up to, like, $6,000, you know. I presume not that much of a conversion if you're going to pounds or euros, but... Even oh, still, I don't it's, know it's, anymore these days. <laughs> yeah, something like that. But you could, it gives you a rough estimate idea, yep. you know. And then it got to me when I was around like 12. My band director was like, um, do you know what instrument you're playing right now? Oh, wow. How good, yeah. how good your instrument is? I was like, I didn't know that. And they're <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, your instrument's like really valuable. So it's still the alto saxophone I use to this day too, by the way. It's still mm. my my main alto and I've traveled many places to it. I play alto saxophone uh, when I tour with Glenn Miller Orchestra as well. So I've been Australia and New Zealand around it too. So I've oh, been many nice. places and have had many uh, experiences with it, you know. You must feel so lucky to have such a valuable instrument and also in a sentimental sense as well. But well, also when you're learning to start off on such a good instrument, you know, because mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know if you whether or not you teach, but you know, that is such a strong thing, isn't it? Whether or not you've got a mm-hmm. decent instrument to kickstart your career, to kickstart your musical journey. Yes, exactly. I don't really, I don't really teach a whole lot. I would sometimes give master classes too, but that is the whole thing too, is that, you know, it is ultimately a, a you kind of get what you pay for. And there's no denying that I was extremely lucky to have gotten this uh, saxophone too at the time. And again, I just had just had no idea, you know, yeah. and none of my parents or grandparents had no idea how nice it was, you know? Really? So what about your dad when he was playing it? Did he not know how great it was back in the day? No, not really. I think because, let's see, if you if you got in like in the 70s or early 80s, I would think that it was, he just, he it was just kind of just the instrument that came out at the time. It was at the music store, so he just bought it, you know? Right. Even my grandparents, who probably bought it, they're like, I don't know. We saw it, and then you know, <laughs> you made a lucky guess, so, and it, well, it must have had to have been right, because then it ended up in your hands. Yeah, <laughs> that's a, a lovely answer. I, I really liked hearing about your precious musical gear, and we know that you've got lots of plenty of other mm-hmm. gear as well. But it's nice to know about that yes. one particular sure. piece. That is a special one for me, for sure, without yeah. a doubt. Awesome. Well, um, I thought I might wrap things up now, but Joe, thank you so much once again for joining me Mm. on the podcast and telling me about your insights regarding remote recording, playing various different instruments, and also video games, because why not? (laughs) So where can people find out more about you and your work? You can find me pretty much on most of the social media too. You can find me on Instagram, uh, Joe DeFiori Music. It's spelled, the last name is spelled D-I-F-I-O-R-E, Joe DeFiori Music. You can also find me on my YouTube channel, which is J-D Wins. That's J-D and Wins, W-I-N-D-S. 
I also have been doing a number of videos on TikTok too, do du- mm-hmm. duets and jamming with other people too. So you can also find me on there too, Jody Fiore Music. Very cool. How are you finding oh. TikTok? I've not joined TikTok because I don't quite understand what it is. I have actually very much enjoyed it because basically, I don't know if you know, but basically you have this option to do a thing called duet where you take a video that someone posted hmm. and then it's kind of one of the things, I think it was meant to see people's reactions to the videos in real time, but I think people have just turned it in such a case where so many people are just like, musicians, duet this, jam over this, see what you could do. And they just play whatever chord progression. And then singers would like write a melody and lyrics. So I would like often like solo or things too. So there's just a lot uh, you could do. I personally haven't quite gotten into that platform because for me, two forms of social media is enough, but Maybe one day yeah. we'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much once again, and thank you for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Damien. That was my conversation with Joe De Fiore. If you're anything like me and a rapidly growing circle of my friends who have been indulging in playing lots of video games recently then you might like to check out Joe's YouTube channel where he's recorded plenty of covers of themes from game franchises such as Mario, Zelda, Animal Crossing, as well as well-known themes from TV shows such as Parks and Recreation. Such a good show. Mark and I binged that show twice during the pandemic. (laughs) It's so feel-good and weirdly prophetic about American politics. I highly recommend Parks and Rec. Anyway, Check out where you can find out more about Joe and his wonderful portfolio of work in the show notes. That's it for today. Special thanks to Roz Nagy for my logo and Daniel Elms for my jingle. What's keeping you busy these days? Get in touch at asitcomespodcast at gmail.com or on the website asitcomes.com where you'll also find all previous episodes and transcripts of the podcast. You can also get in touch with me via Instagram and Facebook, where I highly recommend you give me a follow and a like at As It Comes Pod. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you to those who have already done so, and thanks for continuing to spread the word. Chat to you soon, and take good care. Bye. (music) 